Well, it's like we always say, like my relationship with God, it's, uh, it's not private, but it is certainly personal. I don't see him as being human, so you can't have a human relationship with him. Naniniwala ako na tayo ay mayroong personal na relationship sa Diyos dahil sa scripture at sa pagmamahal natin sa anak niyang si Jesus. There are people who believe that, that uh, uh, what shirt I put on this morning, that, that God cared what shirt I put on. That's nonsense. I do think God is so big and so vast that um, we'll never get to know Him exhaustively. I felt like I heard a voice from heaven speak to my situation and tell me that everything was going to be okay. And I've lived a blessed life since then, since turning my life to God. You have to experience it for yourself. I think it's, it's something hard to describe unless you're actually willing, willing to go there. There is a uh, um, prayer in the book of Ephesians that I want to start with today because it's, it's been on my heart and my mind all week as I've been thinking about that very question, what we're going to talk about this morning. And so Paul is praying this prayer um, for the people of Ephesus and the church that's there. And it really captures my, my hope for what you will experience today, uh, my desire for that. So I want to I pray this over us. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen. I think that uh, it's somewhat natural for us in, in our relationships to desire clarity, right? To kind of make sure that, that we're on the same page. I don't know if you've ever had one of those sort of unequal friendships where, where somebody looks at you and sort of thinks like we're at this level of friendship and you're kind of looking at them and think we're really more of this level of friendship, right? Um, or I, as it's in my case, it's usually reverse. I'm like, you want to be best friends and, and all this sort of thing. I can remember when I was a kid, um, there was this neighborhood uh, guy and we were working on my bike. We were, this is a true story. We were trying to design a trailer for my bicycle so I could um, transport my lawnmower uh, on behind my bike. I was trying to expand the business, you know, like increase my <laughs> range. And he and I were working on this all day. And so one portion of the time we were taking it out for a, a test drive um, and we were on our bikes and he, he just sort of stopped kind of in the middle of the sidewalk and he looks back at me and just says, hey, you want to be friends? And I was like, I thought we were friends. Like, what, what, what was happening up to this time? Were we just business partners? Like, I, you know, or perhaps as, as adults, maybe you've had that situation, right, where you have found the one and you're falling in love and you come to that moment when you're like, I just, I have to tell this person how I feel about them, right? I, I have to let them know how much I love them and I'm gonna say it, I'm gonna tell them. And everything inside of you is both excited and terrified at the prospect that what you're gonna hear back when you say, I love you is thank you, you know? Or that's nice, right? Like, that would be horrible, that's terrifying. Nobody wants that, but we do desire to know and understand how we relate to each other. And over the last six weeks, as we have been in this series and explored God together, we've been talking about, and, and, and I have tried to offer evidence, not only for the existence of God, but I've tried to suggest that it is also the God that we experience and know in the pages of the Bible. And that we have this reliable source that tells us who he is, that we can look at and understand and grow in. In fact, it's actually a very common view in American culture to hold some sort of belief in God. That 90% of us, with varying degrees of certainty, would say that we hold the belief in some sort of God. And so it begs the question, 
If we are convinced, or if we're at least open to the possibility that a God might be out there, if he does in fact exist, then what is this supposed to look like? And how am I supposed to, to relate to him? Is it, is it that sort of distant relative relationship where you see like an update on Facebook every once in a while, but there's no real interaction, no real knowledge or experience of, of a shared story? Or is it something more than that? Can, can I, in fact, know God personally? And if I can, then, then how? How is that experienced? These are the questions that, that I want us to look at together to, this morning. Beginning with that first question, can I know God personally? See, Jesus, interestingly enough, speaks directly into the heart of, of this question. This is from the Gospel of John, chapter 17. Jesus is praying for his followers in this moment, and this is what he prays. In verse 3, he says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Again, he says, this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So according to Jesus, if we take his word seriously, he's not only telling us that it's possible to know God, but it's also the very definition of life. It's, it's the definition of eternal life. If you think all the way back to our very, when we very first began Explore God together, we were looking at the question of, of, of the purpose of life. Does life have a purpose? And so I attempted to, to present that the answer to that question from, from the experience or the narrative of creation in Genesis. That in fact, the very purpose that you and I were made for, the very, the very thing that we were created for was to know God. That we were created to be in a relationship with him. And outside of that, outside of that experience, that we live with this, this sense, this longing, because something is missing. And so now Jesus affirms that purpose. Jesus says, this is eternal life. That they know you. But what follows this description of, of the purpose of life that's given to us in Genesis is how everything gets messed up. It, it's, it's a story of what went wrong. Now, seeds of distrust and of pride are sown into the story. How we see the appearance of, of an enemy who, who speaks to humanity and he says, but listen, God's not in fact good. God, God is withholding from you. He's, he's keeping something from you. And so in Genesis, we see sin enter the picture for the first time in the very thing that we were made for. That thing that, 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 that is, as Jesus says, is life, is lost. It's, it's, it's broken and, and it's gone. The very definition of life is severed. The Old Testament is, is what follows that moment is example after example after example of failed attempts to return to what we were created for. It's humanity's effort to regain that which has been lost, to return to a living relationship with their creator, God, but they can't, we can't. We can't get back there. Do you re can you think of a time in life, maybe you've been on one side of this equation or the other, where there has been some sort of broken trust in a relationship? Maybe it's with a friend, or maybe it's a spouse, or, or maybe it's a coworker, or one of your kids, or something like that. And, and if you're in the seat of sort of the guilty party, the person who broke the trust, and you're trying to work through this, and you're talking, and, and maybe there's ongoing sort of baggage around it, and you ever catch yourself saying, like, I wish we could just go back to how things used to be, right? I wish we could go back to, to how it was before this happened. This is, this is the longing of the human heart as it relates to a relationship with God. 
I wish we could get back there. But we can't get to it. We can't get back there, and so he comes to us. He instead, seeing the futility of our efforts, he chooses to come to us. This is the incredibly unexpected and entirely undeserved move of God towards us. So right alongside all this futility and frustration that we see taking place in the Old Testament, all these attempts to get back to God, there's this beauty that's underlying all of it because alongside this failure is God's movement towards us. It's the story of God coming to us. J.R.R. Uh, uh, Tolkien is, is somewhat famous for, in his books, creating moments of what he calls eucatastrophe, which is the catastrophe is like the unexpected horrible showing up in the scene, right? But the eucatastrophe is, is, is what Tolkien describes it, is those moments when all hope seems lost, when all, all, all that we're left with is despair, and, and in the midst of that, there's this unexpected arrival of good, the, the, the unexpected um, return of hope. It's, it's Gandalf, right? When he's coming up over the horizon, when the battle seems lost, and there's an entire army behind him to bring in victory. Tolkien was, was famous for creating this in his stories, and this This is our story. When all hopes seem lost, God takes on flesh. He he becomes one of us. He he makes his way to us in the person of Jesus. So returning to the Gospel of John, when John describes this moment, this eucatastrophe, we talked about this passage earlier in this Explore God series, but I want to return here for a moment because this is John chapter one, and I want you to hear how he describes this because I think he pictures it perfectly. These are the first four verses. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This is how he is describing Jesus' arrival. And he was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. And hear what he says. He says, in him was life, and that light was the light of all mankind. The light shines into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So what we had previously, what we, our experience had been prior to the arrival of Jesus, he's defining as darkness, and in the midst of this darkness, life. In the midst of the darkness, a light has shone and the darkness has not overcome it. The moment when everything seemed lost, when our only option was despair, God moves in. He intercedes on our behalf. In him was life, John writes. In him is the ability, the opportunity to return to, to regain what's been lost, to go back to our original created purpose of knowing and relating to God. Jesus describes this of himself later in the Gospel of John in chapter 10, in verse 10, the second half of this verse, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's the reason I came, that you may have life, what what Jesus has described as, as knowing God, that you may have it and experience it, that you may have it to the full. See, the most common roadblock that, that, that we experience is it relates to understanding what God has done on our behalf, what he desires for us, what, what Jesus offers to us when he says, I've come that you may have life and that you have it in the full, is the understanding that what he has done is for me. It, it's, it's been done for me. It's been done for you. When, when John is writing his gospel, he does this in a way that I think is so, so poignant because I think he gets at two of the critical elements here. One is understanding our need that is universal and common amongst everybody, is all, and one is understanding our value, that, th- that he places such a high value in each of us that he's done this for us. So he tells two encounters of Jesus in the gospel of, of John. The first is with a man by the name of Nicodemus. This is in John chapter 3. Nicodemus, you may know, is a Pharisee, and so he's an expert in the law. He's committed his life to following the rules, to doing this the right way, to being as, as 
upright and righteous and is everything that human effort can do Nicodemus has committed himself to doing in fact when he comes to Jesus in this conversation he does so it says at night because because just the very prospect of exploring more about what Jesus has said and what it is that he's come to do is somewhat risky for him and so he's careful to sort of not too closely associate himself with this rabbi who's saying these radically different things. And this is where we pick up the conversation. This is John chapter three. I'm gonna read through um, this interaction that, that Nicodemus has with Jesus. In verse three, he says, Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God. No one can be in relationship with God unless they're born again. So how can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into the mother's womb to be born. So he's trying to wrap his head around what Jesus is teaching him here. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised in my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So Nicodemus asks, well, how, how can this be? Jesus says, you are Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we've seen, but still you, uh, still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. So just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so Jesus refers him back to this, this experience of God's salvation for the people of Israel when they are being um, attacked by snakes in the wilderness. He takes him back there and he says, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So Nicodemus, who is this guy who is doing everything that he can, Jesus is saying, what do you need, Nicodemus? What is it that you require? You need to be born again. The apostle John adds some clarity. He adds some commentary to this interaction with with that Jesus has just had with Nicodemus. And he says this, this is perhaps the most widely known verse in all the Bible. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So, so what do you need, Nicodemus? What, what, what does the, the morally, the spiritually, the I've got my act together person need? Jesus is clear. You need to be restored back into a relationship with God. You need to go back to your created purpose. You need to know God personally. As Jesus' words are here, he's saying you need to be born again, born of the Spirit. And then above all that, when Jesus concludes, he says, and this is what I've come to do. This is what I've come to do for you. The second example is, is just a few verses later in, in John chapter 4. And, and it's with someone who is in almost every way on the opposite end of the spectrum than Nicodemus. And it speaks directly into this understanding of worth. Because again, I think that oftentimes our, our mental debate on this is either do I need this? I've, I've done a pretty good job or am I worth it? So Jesus sort of unexplicably goes into Samaria, this place that is, is widely known to be a place that Jews do not visit. There's a, there's a hatred that exists between the Jews and the Samaritans, and Jesus says, I'm going there. And this is where he has this encounter with a woman um, at a well. This is verse 7 of chapter 4. He says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with Samaritan. 
But Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now jump down to verse 25. This conversation encounter continues. And the woman says, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he's going to explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. He says, you're looking at him. Jesus is talking to this person who is culturally and morally and ethnically and in and, and every way, status-wise, socially, on the opposite end of the spectrum from Nicodemus. So much so that the, the common understanding of how God was going to work and move would have excluded this, purpose, this person. The assumption would have been was that she was too far outside to, to be worthy of God's redemptive love. And Jesus encounters her in this personal and perfect way. And he says, I've come to give you the same thing that I came to give Nicodemus because your need is the same and your value is of eternal worth. And so he invites her as he did Nicodemus into this relationship to know God personally, to be given, as he says, living water. A living water that he says in verse 14, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I, um, I was having a conversation with a friend somewhat recently and it was just relaying to me a story and I, I think this speaks to what I, I want you to hear. He was, he was uh, seeing his counselor and, and his counselor was also was a Christian and so they had developed really almost a friendship over the course of their time together, this therapist and him. And, and one of the things that the therapist was encouraging him in and challenging him was understanding the relationship that God desires to have with him. He was a Christian, but he was just saying, I want you to continue to grow in the depth of relationship that God has available to you. And so my friend was kind of processing this and, and, and thinking this through. And so one day he's just in the shower, I think, and he just begins to pray and ask God to, to reveal himself, to take him to that deeper level of relationship, to experience it on a whole new, just that, that, that work of the Holy Spirit that he does in our life. And as he's praying, he gets this very just clear image in his mind of a grapefruit, right? Like that's ex exactly what you're expecting when you're just seeking God. And, and he kind of laughs to himself and he's also sort of just like, this is what I get for trying, right? Like God brings citrus into my mind. And, <laughs> and, and so he sort of dismisses it and goes about his day. And it happens that he has a, a session with his friend, the counselor that evening, and they're just talking and getting up to speed. And because they've become close, the, the, the counselor felt the freedom in the, in the confines of their session to bring in a snack and just kind of eat while they're talking. Um, and he pulls up onto his desk a grapefruit, um, and, he, and he cuts it in half, and he just starts to, to eat this grapefruit, and he's looking at the other half, and he says to my friend, who's just kind of sitting there watching all of this unfold, um, both somewhat excited and a bit nervous, and he takes the other half of this grapefruit, and he just says, hey, this is for you. Like, I, I want you to have this. And he kind of is, is, is laughing. He's like, I'm, I'm good. You know, like, he's like, no, 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 no. Like, understand, like, this is for you. I, wa I want you to have this. And he just starts to laugh. And it's the, the counselor's kind of like, what's, what's so funny? Like, I'm, and he tells him the story. And he's like, I, I was praying that God would, would reveal to me the depths of the relationship that he wants to have. And he brought to mind a grapefruit. And his friend, the counselor, just said, did you hear what I've been saying to you? It's like saying that this, this thing that I've been holding out in front of you, I'm saying this, this is for you. This is what Jesus is telling us. Look at me. He is holding this out, this relationship that we have with God, and he's saying, I want you to understand this is for you. I have done this for you so that you might know him, that you might experience, that you might live according to your, your created purpose, whether you more closely reflect or relate to Nicodemus and you think, you know what, I've, I've put in a solid effort. And, and I've done the best I could. Jesus is holding this out and he says, this is for you. Or perhaps you relate more closely to, to the woman at the well and you feel like I'm disqualified. That this is certainly I'm outside of, of what God would want to do. And Jesus holds this out and he says, this is for you. I've done this for you. So the question that this inevitably leaves us with is how? 
How do we experience this? How do we access this in our, in our lives? I understand and I relate to the fact that, that hearing this for many of us, this sounds like uh, it's too good to be true. Like anytime we hear something like this, we, we, it's mixed with excitement and skepticism, right? And we're asking ourselves the question, how can that be possible? How does he do this? How do we gain access to it? And the answer is, is a thing called grace. The answer is the power of grace in our lives. Of all the wonderful things that you will ever hear or know in your life, grace is the greatest of them all. Grace is, is the greatest thing, the most wonderful thing that you will ever understand in your life. Because grace does the work. Grace is that undeserved, unearned favor of God. And it's the means by which God restores us back into relationship with his father, with our creator, God. This is, this is the way I think of this. It, 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 when my oldest was little, there'd be times when we would go out and be Sherry's birthday or, or Christmas or something like that. And, and I would take her with me and, and pick something out and maybe just kind of out of fun, I would write on the gift that I got for Sherry from Emma, you know, I, and, and, and yet Emma didn't do any of the work. She didn't pay for it. She didn't even really pick it out. In fact, she really had no part. She didn't wrap it. She didn't do anything. It was applied to her as if it was her own. The credit for that. See, this is what Jesus has done for us. This is the power of grace in our lives. Is this God applying to us credit for what he has done? The apostle Paul says it this way in Ephesians. Again, we looked at this verse a couple weeks ago. But he says, it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he words it this way. He says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the beauty of the gospel, that Jesus has come to give us life by taking, claiming for himself, owning what was mine, my sin, everything I've ever done wrong, everything I ever will do wrong, and not only just for me, but for all of you as well, and then putting over me, applying to me his perfection, his, his absolute, un, un, um, un, untainted perfection placed onto me as if it was my own. It's the power of grace. It's grace that saves us. And so what is our response to that? How do we access this? This is where Jesus, he said this to Nicodemus. He says it to us. John, in his commentary, says that you respond by belief. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. You believe. Um, in my student ministry days, I would take students up to Devil's Head uh, Lake in Wisconsin, and we would do hiking and, and rock climbing and, and rappelling. And I don't know if you've ever been rappelling before, um, but it's terrifying. And, and because the way that you do it is you stand on the ledge backwards with your feet. There's like 40 or 50 feet kind of below you. And, and oftentimes the organization that we would go is, why don't you go first, Sterling, so you can show the kids that the rope will hold them. I'm like, are we testing that? Is that, are we confident in that? And so they would put me out there first and I would put my feet on the edge and then you get to this moment and they say, lean back. You need to put your full weight on, on, on the rope and on the harness. It's going to hold you. Now what, what conveys that I believe that that rope is going to hold me? What conveys that that, that harness is going to be able to create me? I lean back. See, belief is, is more than just a, a, a cognitive, intellectual idea that I said, I get this. In fact, it's, 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 it's more than just an emotional response. It's an act of the will that says, I put my trust in this to hold me. This is how we respond to grace. This is how we restore, are restored back into a relationship with God. We put the full weight of our lives, my past, my present, my future, 
all of it in the hands of God and we lean back. And we trust him to hold us. Uh, Paul says it this way in the, in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. He says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. See, to, to enter grace, to access grace, to receive grace, we place the full weight of our lives and our past, our present, our future in the hands of Jesus Christ, and we say we trust him. We acknowledge our need, and we say, I trust him, and I, I trust him to take away my guilt, and I trust him to, to put his perfection on top of me. I'm going to invite the worship team to, to come back up here this morning, and as I said, when we, were, um, when we were beginning this prayer, my hope, my prayer, my desire for all of this Explore God, but specifically for what we've talked about this morning, is that we would know and understand, no matter where you're at in your relationship with God, that you would know and understand in a very personal way the depth of God's love for you, that you would understand, like my friend, did, that God is holding this relationship on. He's saying, this is for you. I've made this possible through grace. See, oftentimes I think we, we have this tendency to overcomplicate what it means to be in a relationship with God. And I want to be perfectly clear this morning that, that if you are in that place where you're trying to work it out on your own, if you're trying to be the best person that you can be, or maybe you're in that place where you said, you know what, Maybe I'm outside of God's reach. I want you to know today that by his grace, you can be restored into a relationship with him. In fact, it's what you were created for. It's the very thing you were made for. As Eric starts to play, I'm going to just leave a, a time of prayer. And if you're here this morning and you would be, you, you know that this is your need and you know that you're ready to respond, I want to invite you to pray as Eric, as Eric plays in just a moment. And you just pray that, that simple prayer, that those words, I believe. I believe in what you have done on my behalf and I believe I place my trust in you to receive your grace this morning. Perhaps you're here and you have been around the church your entire life. Perhaps you understand it intellectually or even you've experienced it emotionally. Today I'm inviting you to believe and to enter into a relationship with him. Perhaps you're one of our students, one of our young ones. Perhaps you have grown up knowing this story because mom and dad have told it to you from the very beginning, but as you hear what I'm describing you today, you're like, I'm ready to make my faith my own. I invite you to pray that prayer, that simple prayer that says, I know I have a need, I confess my need for him, and I believe. Perhaps all of this is brand new to you. Perhaps you're hearing this for the very first time. I invite you to pray that simple prayer where I confess my need for him. And I say, I believe. I'm gonna pray for us and then I'm just gonna leave a time of quiet as Eric, Eric uh, plays and you can pray on your own. And then we're going to respond in worship today. I invite you into a relationship with your creator, God. Meet with him in this time of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord Jesus, as, as each of us prays now on our own, Lord, I pray that you would meet us in this place. Lord, hear our prayers. with you and I believe that you made that possible through your son Jesus Christ and by the grace that he offers us Lord hear our prayers we 
ask this in your name.